All right, so today uh, we're going to be continuing our discussion on 801, which is the neuron theory. And today we're, our topics are going to include hemisphericity and the pontomedullary reticular formation, or the PMRF. So first we're going to get started with hemisphericity, which if you've been here more than five minutes, you've heard us say at least you know, a thousand times. So hemisphericity, I have two definitions I'm going to read to you, and then we're going to kind of break them down, talk about how it actually shows up, uh, talk about it a little bit more. So Hemisphericity can also be seen in the literature as cerebral asymmetry or cortical asymmetry. And it's characterized by an asymmetry in sensory, motor, and autonomic signs, in addition to imbalances in the expression of hemispheristic specialization, which we'll talk about a little bit in a sec. This also includes um, aspects of personality, mood, and cognition. Okay, so that's one definition. The other definition is hemisphericity involves the assumption that two hemispheres of the brain control different asymmetric aspects of a diverse array of functions and that the hemispheres can function at two different levels of activation. The levels of activation are dependent on each hemisphere's central integrative state, which we've talked about a lot. And then I have a whole bunch of causes of hemispheresis. So in functional neurology, hemispheresis is almost like our subluxation, right? It's the thing that we're trying to treat, it's the thing we're trying to find out. In hemisphericity, uh, globally, we're talking about the cortical activation, but we're also looking at the concept of hemisphericity when we're looking at uh, lower level structures like the uh, brain stem and spinal cord and stuff like that. So, specifically, cortical asymmetry is just to the uh, cortices um, in the brain, but you can also apply it to everything else, right? So, the first definition talks about asymmetry in sensory motor and autonomic signs. This is the reason that when we do a bunch of neurological tests, we're always looking bilaterally. So, for example, if we're looking at pupils, right? You're looking, is one pupil bigger than the other? Well, that can mean that either maybe one brain's firing too high or another brain's firing too low. It can be either one, but we're just looking for the asymmetry. So one finding doesn't give us a hemisphericity, right? If you do a blind spot, we're thinking maybe the bigger one is where the hemisphericity is, but until we do the rest of our tests, you can't say. So, a couple um, causes of hemisphericity could be things such as subluxation, spinal stiffness, spondylosis, or DJD, uh, intrinsic muscle weakness, which is kind of your postural tone, you start to get that posturing, uh, increased A to P curves uh, in the lumbar and cervical spine, a increased A to P curve in the thoracic spine, increased postural sway, or pelvic floor weakness, right? And what all that's kind of saying is, if it sounds like this to you guys, is afferent stimulation is decreased, right? That's the big thing. And I was you know, reading a little bit more about um, kind of the concepts of hemisphericity. Really what they're saying is when a brain's not getting activated enough, it's not going to fire quite as well, right? And that's kind of our idea of how we even go about treatments. So we talked about this, I think, three or four weeks ago about the central integrative state and it's largely determined by the afferent stimulation as well as nutrition and oxygen. So what are the three things we need for every neuron to survive? Anybody? Fuel, Fuel oxygen, yeah. oxygen, oxygen, and activation, right? So if you lose any of those things, you start to lose the neuron. And traditionally, hemispheresity, it, it's been around for a while. They talk about it a lot in like psychological and um, psychiatric articles. And it was only applied to the processing of language and visual spatial stimuli. And today we've developed it into almost everything, right? So before you have things like, oh, well, language is more on the left, or you know, um, visuospatial stuff's in one side or the other. And now we're saying, you know what? If you actually look at the brain and you see that there are two distinct hemispheres, if you did on the dissection, they're only connected by those transglossal fibers that are communicating between the two. So if they're, you can think of them kind of almost as opposing forces, right? So you have the two hemispheres that are trying to. Um, each kind of control their part of the body and control different aspects. And if one starts to fire higher than the other, it can dampen or inhibit the other side's activities. Or it can even um, ramp up uh, its side's activities, right? So the new kind of concept um, applies to such things as approach versus withdrawal behaviors, maintenance versus interruption of ongoing activities, uh, asymmetry of the ANS, which we're going to talk about in our next topic uh, in a few minutes of the PMRF. And then asymmetric modulation of sensor, uh, sensory perception, 
and then you know your cognition, attention, learning, sensory processes, stuff like that. So your classic hemisphericities, right, that you hear about in the literature outside of functional neurology are things like left side hemisphericity would be the, such as depression or dyslexia, whereas a right sided hemisphericity, classically, you know, we've all heard about, we just heard Morgan the other day talk about ADHD, right? So ADHD behavioral disorders are classically um, right brain or right hemispheristic uh, problems, okay? So this is, oh, for, for those of you that have been doing this for a while, you know, we do these uh, cerebellar tests, right? Finger to nose and all sorts of stuff. One thing I thought was really interesting is during cerebellar testing, the slowness of movement, not necessarily you know, you know, discoordination, is more likely a breakdown in uh, the cerebrum. So it often represents a decrease in cortical function rather than cerebellar, right? Yeah, so bradykinesic type of movement. So you know, if you have somebody doing finger to nose and they're like this, okay, well you're thinking maybe more cerebellum, but if their one side comes in and hits their nose right away, but then the other one is just kind of like this, now we can think, okay, maybe that's a little bit more cortically controlled. So just a kind of little clinical tip, um, you know, to, to take away from that. So, the, yeah. So basically, when you're looking at hemispheristy, really easy way to think about it is you have the two sides of the brain right here, right? And they're just um, either firing at, they should be firing at this same level, right? If for some reason, say, you know, I don't know, I'm a baseball player, I'm a basketball player, something, and I'm just overusing the heck out of my, the right side of my body, and that's firing over here to my left, we'll say this is the left brain, and I'm just getting a ton of afferent stimulation, it might increase my frequency of firing to up here, and now this brain is more dominant, and it's going to start to suppress the function of the other side of the brain, right? So, in our treatments, what would we do? We would do things that are going to stimulate this right side of the brain, bring up its afferent um, activation, so that they can both fire at a higher rate, okay? So that's the whole idea of hemispheristy. And this is, this is really central to everything that we do and uh, everything we talk about in the rest of the modules, right? Um, anybody have any questions about hemispheristy? We've been over it about a million times, but I just kind of wanted to summarize it and give you a really global picture. We're we pretty good with that? Okay. Uh, the next thing I'm gonna talk about is, well, Russ isn't here today, unfortunately, but the PMRF, Anybody that's been here for a couple quarters knows that Russ loves the PMRF, right? So, what is the PMRF? It's the short way of saying the pontomedullary reticular formation. So, in the brainstem, you have your mesencephalon, which is right under the thalamus, right? And under the mesencephalon, you have your pons, and then your medulla, and at the bottom of the medulla starts your spinal cord, right? So this is how all the information from your brain, all this processing, goes down to talk to your body to say, this is what we decided to do, right? So the uh, pontomedullary reticular formation is just this massive network of neurons in the pons and the medulla that deal with everything, essentially. So the, the way I've heard it described is if you want a good way, to, if you have insomnia and you need to go to sleep, pick up a book about PMRI. If you have, you know, just want to read something that's about that thick, read something about PMRI. It, you know, it's extremely complicated. There's so many connections. It's, you know, there's a ton of information. But for us as functional neurologists, there's about four main functions that we need to know about and be able to evaluate um, in treating the PMR, correct? Right? And uh, just kind of a side note, uh, reticular is just means web-like, right? So even the name is saying it's really complicated, there's a lot of stuff going on. So what are the four main functions of the PMR? I know most of the people in here know, so let's go with the first one. Who wants to say anymore? What's that? Not you. You already know. Anyone? Any of you guys? No? All right. Old guys. All right. So on what side? Okay. So it's going to inhibit pain ipsilaterally. And for anybody that was at the module this weekend, we know that it uh, inhibits the pain actually by attenuating the pain signal coming in from the dorsal horn. So um, it's going to fire down. The PMR is going to fire down to where the pain stimulus is coming in and dampen it. So it inhibits pain ipsilaterally. What's the second thing that it does? Inhibits <coughs> IML. Inhibits IML. Okay. On what side? And 
And the IML, if you remember, is also known as the ILCC. It's the intermedial lateral cell column, and it's the primary output of the sympathetic nervous system. So when we were talking earlier about um, hemisphericity, the cortex, we, we talked uh, maybe week two about the fact that only about 10% of cortical output goes to um, contralateral volitional involvement, right? 90% of the output is going down to the brain stem and uh, medulla, all that kind of stuff. So this is like your corticospinal tracts, right? And this is all going down to your mesencephalon, pons, and medulla. Well, out of this 90%, here's your mesencephalon, your pons, and your medulla. Out of this 90%, only 10% goes to the ipsy and contra mesencephalon. So let's say five-ish percent, right? The other 90% out of here, goes to your pontomedullary reticular formation. So, for you math whizzes out there, it's about 81% of your uh, brain output is going to your PMRF, right? And if the main, one of the main functions is to inhibit the IML, if you lose brain activation, right, and you're not stimulating this PMRF, it's not gonna inhibit the IML, and it's gonna allow the IML to bring up its level of activation. So, one of the, um, we'll, we'll go over the findings of this, but one of the things that, uh, you know, Dr. Carrick likes to look at is almost like a window into the, the sympathetic nervous system is to look in the eyes and check the vein to artery ratio. So if you have, you know, a B VA ratio that's one to one, that's awesome, right? They're, you know, you're not firing sympathetics too high, but if you have say a one to one in one eye and a three to one in the other, that sympathetic nervous system on the other side is working three times as hard as the other one. That can be a problem, right? So when you're talking about, um, bringing this up so you can evaluate it, right? Using your VA ratios, using, um, looking at you know how sweaty hands are, stuff like this, and you find out, oh, the IML is not firing properly, and this person, say you have a patient that comes in with a bunch of pain, and it's not firing, well, you also know that the brain that's not firing down to the, inhibit the IML is also not inhibiting pain. So now you're thinking, okay, if I can get this brain to start working and start inhibiting, or start activating the PMRF, maybe I can get a little bit of this pain suppression in there. And this, this is kind of how we're working through this. I'm trying to, trying to make it a little bit interesting, whereas it isn't. <clears throat> and uh, what's the third thing that the PMRF does? And there's Russ, he'll know these. Russ, what's the third thing that the PMRF does? For old time's sake. Oh, is this where you want me to say something? Oh, oh, are you used to us not talking? Okay, yeah. I understand. <laughs> third one? Anyone? There we go. So we're going to inhibit. Looks like an H. So we're going to inhibit anterior muscles above T6 and posterior muscles below T6. And why does it do this? Why would we want to inhibit these muscles? They might know. We talked about this this weekend. Huh? Yeah, to stand up. So, you know, when if you look at, say, a dog or anything that walks on four legs, right, you know, they're kind of hunched over like this. Well, in order to stand up, you know, you have to bring these, uh, inhibit the anterior muscles and allow the posterior muscles to bring this part up. And you also have to inhibit the posterior muscles to allow the anterior muscles to bring you up, right, right? So as you start losing brain activation, we talk about you'll start seeing posturing. And the type of posturing you see is towards the, um, kind of four-legged position, right? So you'll see the arms start to go in like this, the leg flare out, and you'll start to see activation of those muscles that were previously inhibited, okay? And the fourth and final um, function of the PMRF, there's one more. Sets global tone. Global tone, okay. So, and the way it does that is it inhibits the inhibitory interneurons that project on the ventral horn cells. So the ventral horn cells are where all the motor neurons come out, right? And what it's going to do is it's going to inhibit the inhibitory neurons uh, to actually facilitate muscle tone. And so it's going to set global tone. And the tone you can look at by doing things like when you're doing a leg check, and normally you just bring them up to see how level the legs are, you know, just keep moving their legs in and see if one leg pushes back more than the other, right? Because that's just kind of their global tone. That's one way to, to take a look at it. So these are the four main functions of the PMRF, and how do we evaluate it? You know, how, how would you go about trying to figure out the, the functioning of the PMRF? You know, we talked about VA ratio, right? 
Uh, does anybody have any other 